Welcome to the 30 minute hour. It's the personal development podcast for entrepreneurs that are making seven figures and looking to level up and become unstoppable. I'm your host, Eric Twiggs, your procrastination prevention partner. Joining me as always, you know him as the super CEO, the business strategist extraordinaire, and all around good guy, Ted Fells. Good, good evening, all. How you doing? Happy Monday. Good evening. Happy Monday. It certainly is a happy Monday. And the Monday is about to get happier, Ted, because <laughs> we're going to be talking about how to magnetically attract your dream clients. That's right. So you, you you ever see some people that it seems like the best clients are just attracted to them and you're like, man, how, how do they keep getting these uh, great opportunities? And they, they, they're just so lucky. And there's no luck that there's a science to it. So that's one of the things you'll, you will pick up the science as you listen to our guest today. So definitely this is one you want to lean in on. But please know that this is not your everyday podcast. You know, we, we do things a little different here on the 30 minute hour. And Ted, did, I don't think we warned. We didn't warn our guest this time, did we? We just. No, he, <laughs> uh, he, he's going to discover. Uh, we, we do things a little differently. So, but definitely you can watch us live like many of you are right now on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or on YouTube. Uh, you can actually go back and listen to this episode on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any one of those other places where you like to consume uh, podcast content. Uh, and then special shout out to uh, Lola Wilson, who has been commenting. Uh, good evening to you as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. And I see quite a few others that are logging on. Please feel free to comment. You know, we, we want to make this a, a dialogue and a conversation. because You, you really want to hear what our guest is going to share. And I, I'm going to go ahead and bring him on right now. But uh, I'm going to pose a question before I bring him on. Here's the question. Do you have the power to speak naked? That's the question I have for you. Do you have the power to speak naked? And before you log off your computer, hear me out. <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this, believe it or not. I will tell you, though, um, after watching or listening to this show, you'll definitely want to get it. So, so our guest, he is the author of the number one best-selling book, the power to speak naked uh, and he's the managing director of total buy uh, in where he works with executives and ceos helping them to show up powerfully behind the mic to gain the exposure that they need so please join me in welcoming to the 30 minute hour podcast tyler foley oh eric I, I feel like I should have come out with like a NBA jock jams behind me with that and like come through the tunnel. One of these things, you know, <laughs> just all hyped and ready to go. We, we need to add like crowd, you know, crowd noise that, that that'll right. really take it to that next level. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was no, welcome. I felt, yeah. No, I, I, and thank you for the warm introduction. It's my joy and my pleasure to be on here and, you know, see what we can do in this here 30 minute hour. Yes, let's see what we can do. And I, I do definitely want to give people the, the backdrop and, and you, the full perspective. So let, let's kind of start back from the beginning when you were at the Southern Alberta Institute of Technology. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, what was your, your vision for your career at that time? Oh, to be a geomatics professional and run my own mapping firm with my business partner, and uh, have a, a fleet of aerial plane, like aerial photography. So planes and cameras in the sky and, uh, you know, playing with fancy lasers and new and emerging technologies. 
that was that was you know build an empire similar to the mapping firm that my uncle had built and you know make my fortune and my way in the world that was the plan hmm. okay all right that, that's interesting so so how did how did things kind of evolve from kind of having that vision to just some of these experiences you've had leading up to this point well uh to be honest it was uh you know Tony Robbins says it best, life happens for you, not to you. And I've had a series of kind of pivotal moments in my life that have, you know, kept bumping me into the path that I'm on right now. And one of them was when my business partner passed away, um, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, uh, entire company collapsed realistically over a weekend. Um, she wasn't feeling good on a Friday and uh, she went into the hospital and, and never came out. And I got the call on Sunday that she had passed away. So it was Sorry for your loss. Well, and I appreciate that. But and it, the funny thing is, is it's it's happened twice to me in my life where I've had a mentor who was a business partner, but also a friend and my main revenue stream. Um, you know, I'd put all my eggs into that basket and and to have it literally evaporate overnight has was a was a really hard lesson to learn but from the ashes as everything a beautiful phoenix did arise um in that type of work your primary client is the government and anytime you're working for the government they want you to have a safety system in place and so between me and my business partner i drew the short straw and i had to be the one to go and take all the boring safety training and while I was taking the safety training, I realized that, you know, I, I've always had this. It's funny that you mentioned SATE. Anytime I see a thing and I go, I could do that better. I always want to put my money where my mouth is. I actually became the valedictorian of my graduating class uh, for SATE because of uh, seeing my wife graduate and watching her valedictorian going, I mean, he's all right, but I could do better. And I just gotten my acceptance letter from uh, from the school. I'd, I'd applied, inspired by my wife going back to school and finishing up her diploma. And so I had uh, I'd watched this gentleman give us this presentation. And I made it a goal. I was like, no, I am going to be valedictorian. And I was uh, two years later. I was the one on the stage. And the funny thing is, is the valedictorian address that I gave actually ended up becoming a keynote uh, presentation. One of the, uh, presenters who was getting an honor honorary degree from the school, uh, reached out to me and was like, would you mind giving that at my company? And I was like, no, I'm happy to do it. So that, you know, little things like that have always been a nod to me that speaking was going to be in my, my future. But I had with, with the business collapsing, I had had to take all the safety training. And so a friend of mine had reached out to me and said, uh, you have, essentially most of your designation if i pay for you to upgrade your skill set uh, you could become an ncso would you come and work for me as a safety professional and i said sure because i was lost i didn't know what to do and you know i always had an entrepreneurial spirit but when you kind of need to recenter stable steady work seemed like a good idea so I, I went and I became a safety manager for my friend's electrical company. And uh, in the course of that, delivering safety presentations and toolbox talks and safety meetings, uh, a lot of people started to realize that I could do them and not make them boring because safety is definitely an invitation to a lobotomy on occasion. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was, you know, I, I just gave the messages a little bit different, a little bit more entertaining. And a lot of people... I took note of it and ended up asking me to deliver a lot of safety keynote presentations, which when my contract with my friend expired, because it was only ever going to be for a year, um, really opened up that door and that opportunity for me to reestablish myself as a solopreneur and then an entrepreneur and then a business owner. And it was, just, it, it, it's the path I've been on for the last eight years. Mm -hmm. Man, I mean, th that, that's an amazing story. I, I wasn't aware of the part of your business partner just passing away suddenly. It basically forced you to pivot. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it was one of those things where, it, you know, you're always taught to expect the unexpected, but you don't expect that. And uh, we didn't have the right director's insurance in place. And we were playing with really, really uh, state of the art technology that was very, very expensive. I mean, especially when you're running a fleet of three planes. Um, and then attaching lasers and large 
plat and cameras onto it. Like the, the camera rig was lar- as big as I am and I'm five, eight. And that's the size of the camera that we had loaded into these planes. So there, you know, was large equipment. And then when we moved into mobile uh, interior mapping, you know, it was state of the art and it was expensive. And so mm-hmm. when she was gone, we didn't have the right director's insurance in place and literally all my hopes and dreams and money <laughs> went up in, in a, in a dash. And it really was, it was one of those moments where you have to look at yourself and say, well, where are we at? Because it, you know, her life stopped, but mine didn't and it needed to go forward and I needed to figure out a way fast. Yeah. It's interesting. We, uh, so Ted and I are part of something called the what now movement. And that's, literally the mission of the organization is okay what now yeah. when things happen you, you have to ask yourself what now and pivot and it sounds like that's what you did you asked yourself what now and you made the right pivot now, now i am curious like if you could go back and talk to the younger version of yourself that was back uh in college uh, basically knowing what you know now what advice would you give to that younger version of yourself be more humble <laughs> I I was an unbelievably uh, cocky individual in my late twenties into my early thirties. Um, I I had the the thing about younger me is I had been working since I was six years old. I I, I was a child actor growing up. I, I grew up on stage and film and TV, and it was you know I got to experience so much of the world. I got to travel so much like you know i you know i had uh, i had to renew my passport not because it had expired but because my passport had too many stamps in it that the um customs wouldn't let me through until mm-hmm. i got blank sheets and so like you know I, I i felt very worldly very wise um but i wasn't you know even now i i look at myself and i go i feel like i have a lot of knowledge but the older i get and the smarter i become the more i realize how much i don't know <laughs> and that you know and i i really do thirst for knowledge so i would i would definitely uh, give myself the advice uh, to be a little bit more humble and i think that would uh, have given me the opportunity to develop a few more relationships earlier on that could have helped me out uh, in my need uh, which is you know one of the things and i think if i could give myself another bit of advice it's not only be humble but uh it's something that i've done f- instinctively for a long while but i think i would have done it more um with more intention is maintaining relationships and understanding Mm -hmm. the value of relationships be humble and understand the value of relationships no i think that's great advice to give to yourself now I, i do find that a lot of people who are successful they have a certain level of confidence that's mixed with humility i do think there's a baseline level of confidence that you need to succeed, but at the same time, you need to have a level of humility. Can you talk about that? What what are your thoughts on that? Oh, no, you're a hundred percent. Right. I think, um, and the two are not mutually exclusive either. Like you can be very confident and still be very humble. I I look Mm -hmm. at my uncle as probably the greatest example in my life. He, he, you as he's, started from humble beginnings, made an absolute fortune, lost it all, made it all back, lost it again, you know? um, And yet he does it every day with a smile. He gets up and and he finds a new thing, right? Like he's what now is probably, if I had to ask him, I bet you it's one of his mantras. Well, what do we do now? How do we fix this? How do we solve this? And I watch him do it with such an even keel. He is probably the most um, humble and just, genuine human being i've ever met and it doesn't matter where he's at in the pendulum of you know abundance or lack because he always sees the abundance you know Mm -hmm. he may not have one thing but he has all of the rest of this over here and so i think it's really important to recognize that you can be very confident in who you are and still have your feet on the ground and, and controlled in in knowing how you got there And I think the most successful leaders know where they're going and that they haven't gotten there yet. And I think that's where you see these people with these big visions and they're, you know, and they can make people come together and really get everybody 
in line with their thought, their passion, because they recognize that they haven't gotten there yet. I think of even uh, JFK's speech about getting to the moon. It was an impossible task, literally an impossible task. They, at the time, there was no way that the United States was ever making it to the moon. In 1961, no. 1962, no, absolutely not. He comes up and says, by the end of this decade, or in you know the nice accent decade i i listen to that speech all the time in this decade or the next uh you know he, he's and they get there they get there july 1969 neil armstrong puts his feet on the moon that was impossible seven years from the time that statement was made to when they actually did it and that's incredible that is and on top of it that was that was a man putting forward a thought and an idea so powerful that it transcended his death <laughs> that yeah, it could have been real easy in 1963 to walk away from that and be like, nope, you know what? It's going to be too expensive and it's too crazy and it's not achievable. And they could have walked away, but that was leadership getting some, getting people in line to be able to be like, no, we're proceeding for this, no matter the circumstances. And I think that's true leadership. They didn't know how they were going to get there, but we will find a way. Yeah. So it's interesting you say that because Ted and I were talking about this earlier you know, we we do a show called Thank God It's Monday, and we were talking about how you have to, the belief starts uh, when you want to do the impossible. But when when people are following you, they, they're actually following the leader first and the vision second. Mm -hmm. and, and so, right, so so even if it seems impossible, like we, we actually use the example of going to the moon, right? Hey, we're going to the moon. Okay, I believe you, Mr. Kennedy, Mr. President, I had no idea how we we're going to get there. It seems impossible. We're following you. Let me talk about that. I mean, I, the, the importance of you know, the leader understanding that really people have to buy into you first before they buy, buy into the vision. Well, I think the two, I, you need to be able to communicate what the vision is. And it's your lens of your vision that yeah. people, you, they have to see through you. You become the vessel. Mm -hmm. You become the lens for which they are seeing what could be. Even if it seems impossible, you're like, yeah, but hey, break it down. We've already got these rockets. Now, if we put in, you know, if we get a slightly bigger rocket or if we get these experts, we we are the greatest industrial nation on the planet. Why can't we? We are the innovators. We are free enterprise. Let's do this. Let's prove that that we can do this. And that a shared vision will get us to the moon. And as a leader, you have to be crystal clear with what that path is, right? Your job is to take your followers from point A to point B. That is your job is to move them along that path. But it's the same as if I was to try to get from Chicago to LA or from New York to LA. I can't, if I don't know where my start position is, I can want to get to X, Y, Z place. But if I don't know where I start, I can't plug it into my GPS and I can't start to create a map or a guideline to get there. So I think the really good leaders don't just have a vision of where they want to get to. I want to get to LA. The, the real visionaries know exactly where they are on the planet before they start taking that first step. I am here on, you know, Broadway and Chelsea and I'm going to go that away and that is where I'm going to end up and these are the paths I'm going to take and these are the states that I'm going to visit these are the uh, waypoints and, and markers along the way that we're going to hit in order to get to that point point. and I think the, the really effective leaders have that innate ability to know where they are now and what their surroundings are because that allows them to judge what the resources that they have, what resources that they need. You know, are we running low on supplies, gentlemen? Because we're about to be crossing over the Rocky Mountains. And it's and what time of the year is it? Do we have the gear in place to sustain ourselves for this last push? And I think those are the really, really good leaders have an excellent pulse of where they are so that they can communicate the best way to get to where they want to go. No, great comment. So, Ted, you and I were just talking about it. What, what thoughts do you have? I mean, again, it's all in 
you know, it's a, it's all in the mindset. I mean, we talk about that all the time. I mean, wherever you're going to go, it's all possible. It's in your mindset. And, and as leaders, yeah, you know, as Tyler's saying, I mean, you know, the leaders lead, right? And, and, and that's what you do. And, 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 and wherever it's going, I mean, you know, those people just kind of line, you know, people line up behind you. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think I, one time I heard some, someone was telling me, I guess they had, had all these, these students from all these different universities that would get together at this, in this one classroom and had this instructor there talking about some type of a project. And then he, he or she just kind of walked out, right? And everybody's just kind of sitting around. But then at some point, someone stands up, right? And then just, you know, goes to the board and just starts leading. And then people, you know, people follow. I mean, I think that's, you know, yeah, that's just kind of how that goes. Yep. No, that's 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 a great illustration. Well, uh, and man. to Ted's point, it's usually the person who stands up and speaks first that is identified as the leader. It's the person mm-hmm. who because that's the action step, right? That's right. as a human being. That's usually the first action that we can take is to use our voice and to say, hey, fill that void, fill that silence. And it's so many. Right. How many times? I, I always equate it back to if you've ever been taking a test, right? You'd have to think way back, way back, way back to school. I have to do it too. And you were doing some kind of an exam and the instructor had made a mistake on it, right? And they, they'd given you, say it was two plus two and your options were three, five, seven, and eight. And everybody's <laughs> scratching their head trying to figure out what, what they're missing because they're pretty sure two plus two is four, but they've got three, five, seven, and eight. And none of those are the right answer. And finally, finally, one person goes, "Uh, Mr. Twiggs, um, uh, question number 15 here, uh, two plus two, it should be four, right? And Mr. Twiggs looks down and goes, yes, gentlemen, that is correct. I have, I've made a mistake. My apologies. Uh, just scratch that question out or write four and circle that do it. You know, let's indicate that this is, this is a, it's going to be a freebie for you. And, and then as soon as that one person said the thing, what does everybody else in the class do? Oh yeah, no, I was struggling with that too. I didn't know what to do. I was <laughs> right, like, I'm so glad you said the thing and you hear like 20 other people all give this sigh of relief. Cause finally somebody had the courage to stand up and say a thing. And that's, that's leadership, having the courage to know in your core, I know, I think I'm right. In fact, I know I'm right. Two plus two is four. These answers are incorrect. We need to address this and, and stand up for it and say, no, this is wrong. Whatever your wrong is. And it, those are the people who are leaders. You know, and you look at the the great leaders, particularly the ones that have come out of, of the U.S. I, you know, I think of Abraham Lincoln stood up and said, "This is wrong. This is what I'm going to do." Uh, uh, J. Uh, Martin Luther King, same thing. This no, this is wrong. I don't. I know in my core that this is wrong. I have a dream. This is wrong, and he's right. He was right. He still is right. It was wrong, and so. It that's leadership. Those are the people who come up and they look at the situation. And they go, no, 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 no. Two plus two is four. I don't care that you're giving me options three, five, six, and seven. <laughs> it's four, and no. I'm standing my ground on it. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point, and I think you, as a leader, you, you have to be willing to get your flowers later, because a lot of times, you know, the, the it looks glamorous now. But during the time, these people were despised for make, for taking their stand. When everybody else is zigging and they're zagging, you know, they were despised during their time. But now we look back on them as these great people. But the people you mentioned, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, even, even we go back to John F. Kennedy. I mean, there were people that they assassinated him. I mean, yeah. they, were, they were despised during their time. So I do think it takes a certain level of courage um, to to really be an effective leader that has the impact. Uh, so, yeah, no, and, and, it, and you're right. You know, courage is not a lack of fear. It's overcoming it. Yeah, there you go. Very well said. Very well said. So, so you're currently, speaking of leadership, you're the managing director of Total Buy-In. 
Yeah. So let's talk about this. Like, like who is your ideal client and how do you serve them? Well, it, it's funny because total buy-in has become a, a self-fulfilling prophecy and a monster unto itself. And that's why I'm managing director because total buy-in actually oversees uh, four different parent companies now. And we, it started as just a safety consulting company. You know, I'd moved into safety. And when my contract with, with my friend had expired, I was going to branch out on my own again and do the safety consulting. And the, the consulting rapidly became training and auditing of safety programs. And the training really became the focus. And one of my most popular training courses was a course that initially was called Basic Instructional Technique. And it was uh, public speaking 101, but you didn't tell people that it was public speaking up front or they would never come into the into the class. Right. right. No, I don't public speak. It's amazing the number of people who will make that statement. I do not public speak. And and yet, if that was true, no restaurant in the planet could ever mm -hmm. exist. Because. If you've gone in and you didn't know your wait staff and you ordered food and it came to you, you talked in public, you talked to a complete stranger and you asked for what you want and got it. So this notion that I'm uh, terrified to speak in public, I uh, can't speak to strangers and I certainly couldn't ever ask for what I want is null and void for anybody who has ever been into a restaurant and gotten the food that they asked for. And yet so many people will, 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 literally not take a course that their employer requires them to take as part of a certification. And they would rather make less money as long as, Hey, just don't make me stand up in front of people and talk. It's, it's crazy to me. So we, I, I was clever and called it basic instructional technique. And it ended up becoming my most popular training course to the point where it actually spun off and became the power to speak naked, which became its own entity. So as managing director of total buy-in, I'm actually making sure that the safety consulting and my my team of, of safety professionals who know a whole bunch more about safety than I do are supported and have the resources necessary so that they can sustain the business. And then I, you know, make sure that the entity that is Tyler Foley and Sean Tyler Foley Inc. moves forward and this brand happens and that the power to speak naked and power of influence um, brand has its momentum as well. And, and we're supporting the live events and the training and all the rest of that. It's, it's just, it's, it's grown. So my job is to know who's smarter than me and strategically place them into positions where they can excel and then reap the rewards. So, so, so your, but your client is, is it, are these executive CEOs? Yeah, so you're right. That was the question that you had initially asked that I didn't answer in my diatribe. Uh, they, yes, what has happened is the who we've focused on is executives and CEOs. And uh, surprisingly enough, a really interesting sub niche is actually uh, charity directors. Uh, I find that they're the ones who get the most out of the programs and who I feel I get the most uh, joy and pride out of seeing them come alive, find their story, find their voice to support their charity because the, the charities are doing good. I don't mind helping CEOs. You know, you want to be a fortune 500, you want to make a whole bunch of money and build some wonderful widgets that improve the lives of human beings all over the world. Great. But charity directors are doing the hard work mm -hmm. and oftentimes unrecognized and don't have the resources and support. So that's been a really interesting niche that's developed over the last four years where um, a big wing uh, of what we're doing is making sure that those charity directors are able to speak their truth in a powerful mm -hmm. way. Hmm. So it's a curious to hear, I'm sure you've got a lot of success stories from people who have applied your framework. Maybe they went from being a terrified of public speaking to really taking things to the next level. Do you have a favorite story that comes to mind? Oh, yeah. No, my favorite one is uh, a good friend of mine when I was first launching the program and trying to really um, delve into the psychology of why people have phobias. I reached out to a friend of mine who's a psychologist and she laughed because I, I was trying to discover just generically what the mindset of somebody who is who's genuinely afraid of public speaking versus the people who just say they are because they're uncomfortable speaking to a crowd which is two totally different things. And, uh, you know, and I had this hunch and it's been affirmed that 
that most people are actually not afraid of public speaking. They're actually afraid of public judgment. Mm-hmm. So I was having this discussion with her and she goes, it's funny that you, that you're reaching out Tyler, because I'm actually legitimately terrified of public speaking. And I was like, well, give me an example of what I like. How is, is it hindering you? And she says in, in the worst ways possible. She's like, I have this idea. And her idea was to provide um, virtual counseling to remote communities who don't have access to mental health resources. Mm. And now she's having this discussion in 2015. And so this was like, you know, Zoom wasn't even a thing at that point, I don't think. And if it was, it was just barely. And, you know, if you wanted to talk about a video conference, you were still talking Skype. People would say, I would Skype you. That was, you know, terminology at the time, right? And she's like, so I want to do something like Skype where I, you know, we can have these conversations one-on-one, but the College of uh, Clinical Psychologists says that you need to be in room with the person. And I don't think that's true. And they, you know, and I actually think it's more safe if we're, if they're comfortable in their own environment and then I'm in my environment, if there's any kind of weirdness, I can, you know, I have the, I have more resources available to me if I am actually separate than if I'm closer. And she went on to explain a whole bunch of things. And she's like, in fact, I've had, I've pitched this idea to a couple of uh, venture capitalists, but I've canceled on the meeting three times because I'm afraid to talk to the group. Mm-hmm. It was only 12 people, 12 people in a room, all of them with millions of dollars that they wanted to give her to try and fund this project because they thought it was a really good idea. And she kept canceling the meeting wow. because she was terrified to speak in front of people. Wow. And she's like, if you can help me get over this, she's like, I'm a psychologist. So if you can help me bend my mind around this idea of public speaking that, you know, that will actually have a real impact for me and for the people that I serve. And so we did, we worked together for about three months. Um, and she, she went in, she pitched this meeting, pitched a couple of more subsequent ones, put together fantastic presentations. And the thing is, is she knows her stuff. And once she got confident in realizing that these people were on her side, that she had nothing to fear like to see her in her element, I got to see a recording of, of the one pitch and she was on fire. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. Sure enough, she gets the money and she grows. So the, she was making a comfortable living, you know, a, a, a nice low to mid six figures. But she rapidly took the stuff, onboarded a few other uh, professionals who, who were in on the idea they have this really nice charitable component. So they're, they're doing virtual therapy for, you know, the people like me who are, who are sad because, you know, we lost 10 points on the stock today and now I'm depressed, Not really depressed. I just want to complain to somebody. So she takes my complaining money and then uses that as a fund to pay for the professionals who then can help treat some of these people in the remote communities who can't afford this kind of help otherwise and so they pool the money and a percentage of it goes to pay for these people to be able to receive their counseling for free what ended up happening was it was a fantastic success and she ended up growing to seven and then eight figures Mm. by 2019 well what happens in 2020 pandemic the world shuts down everybody's having mental health crises and nobody can go anywhere so what are they looking for virtual help and her business just exploded, just absolutely exploded overnight because she was she was the leader. She was on the forefront. She was the one who said, this could be possible. I know that we have the technology here and I believe that this is the way that it is. And all these people who are saying that you cannot deliver mental health care without somebody face to face in the room are wrong. We have this ability to connect with people. And although it's not 100%, it's 90%. And 90% is better than nothing, especially for the people who legitimately have nothing. And that's who I want to help. And she wouldn't stop until somebody else saw her vision and she transcended it. She conquered her fear. And now not only is she living an incredibly comfortable life with her partner on a beautiful island, they've got a new baby and her business is running itself but she is having an impact and helping people literally save lives. And that, that is why I know that the power to speak naked was something that needed to be out there because I have so many examples. That's my favorite one, but I have so many examples. I can give you a list of at least 20 off the top of my head where I've seen the impact of people's stories. 
Mm. I, I would say that's an incredible story. If somebody can go from being totally afraid of public speaking to making seven and eight figures as a result of it, that, that mm. that's impressive. So I, we, we have to find out more about your, your framework here. So I'm, I'm just curious, like what steps can the entrepreneur take that wants to magnetically attract their dream client? What can they do to accomplish that? Well, the first thing is to really do that self-assessment on yourself, right? We've been talking about it over the whole last half hour about leadership, having this ability to know who you are, where you are, you know, and be able, able to align yourself to that internal compass. So the first thing you need to do, you want to magnetically attract people to you. You need to know who you are so that you know who those people that you need to attract to you, uh, what their demo is. And so that self-analysis up front is really important. And then recognizing that the thing you're afraid to say is probably what your ideal client needs to hear. Mm. So much of our time is spent putting on this facade, being this person that we're not. And when you come out and you're like, no, you know what? This is who I am. This is who I am. And this is what I do. Uh, I actually in my book and it would, it's funny because I was just on another podcast and I'd forgotten that I'd written it in my book and it was a one-off comment that I'd made. So I didn't actually write my book. I spoke my book. My book comes from a whole bunch of my training courses. And I remember, I still remember the training uh, to this day. And when I made this comment and it was brought to my attention, I'm like, what do I have to complain about? I'm a middle-class white male in my early forties. My harshest problem today is, is nothing compared to the majority of the world. Like I, I am the ideal of comfort, you know, Oh, I, I lost a little bit of revenue today. You know, I didn't make that sale or whatever. Like it's like, they're so insignificant. And I recognize that. And to be able to say, look, look, this is, this is where I am at. And especially because most of my clients are, uh, female 35 to 50 charity directors who have real stories who are like, no, I was destitute. And, you know, I saw how much pe people were struggling to feed their children. I was struggling to feed my children. So I've made this charity that now goes and supports mothers who have nowhere to go, you know, or, um, I, 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 beautiful charity that I work with, um, deals with early childhood and, uh, and pregnancy loss. You know, mm -hmm. and it's a more common. I didn't realize how common it was. It's like one in three women will experience this in their lives. Wow. That's it's, it's incredible to me, you know, and, and you got to remember part of that, of this statistic that won't experience it is because they've made the decision that they don't want children. So right. if you look at the people who actually want children, you're probably looking at like one in two will experience some kind of early infancy or pregnancy loss. And she herself had experienced that and was devastated by it. And there were, and looked around thinking to herself, surely with, you know, living in North America, we will have resources to deal with this. And they didn't. And so it's, it's amazing to me to see uh, that me in this look and this face, this avatar, when I'm telling people that they have a story to do it, who it resonates with the most tends to be, you know, the Adidas of the world. The, that run these charities, they, they tend to be female, mission-driven, incredible stories, and, and are afraid to step into the spotlight because they don't want to take away from the stories of the people that they're helping. And I'm like, no, your story is what's going to help the people that you want to help. You need to step into the spotlight and do that. And so that's right. Like it's understanding where you are so that you can tell the vision so that people can be like, you know what? I want to go there too. And I think that's, that's the real key. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because the other thing is people say, yeah, what, what, what am I going to say? If I, if I speak, what am I going to say that hasn't already been said by other people already? But I think your, your story is what makes you unique because you're really the only person on the planet that has your specific story. And that's what separates you from everybody else. And you are the authority on your story. So nobody knows your story better than you. So nobody can tell it better than you. Nobody has the details. And it's and, and one of the things that I learned working with Bo Eason is the more detailed you make your story, the more universal it will speak to your audience. Mm -hmm. So knowing who you are at your core, not being afraid to say the thing that you are afraid to say, finding the courage to stand up and speak it anyways that's what's going to resonate with your ideal audience. And that's when you can 
truly find your avatar. And that's when you can truly find your leadership because you, again, right. Who's the leader. It's not the person who's called CEO or president or, or you know, supervisor teacher. No, no, no. It's the person who has the bravery to stand up and speak first. And if you have the bravery to stand up and speak first there, I promise you, it's the same thing as the exam in the class. You say it and everybody else is going to be like, I was thinking it. I was thinking it. I just didn't want to say it. I'm so glad you said it. Tell me more. And knowing your story through and through, because you're right. You know, there are many other people who probably have had similar circumstances to us or have, have done things similar but nobody's done it the exact same way we have. And they're probably struggling, wondering what to do with it too. So if you come up and say, Hey, this is a thing that I dealt with. This is how I dealt with it. Who wants to know more? That's when the people start to get in line and ask, how do we get there? Now that this is great. And I think storytelling is, is really the key. You know, even if you're not even, even if you're not even talking about speaking, if you're talking about if somebody pulls up your website, they should be able to see your story. Um, and, and it, it could still have some of these components in it. And, and I think that'll, that'll attract people uh, to you. I, this is great. I mean, so just to kind of, for those of you that just joined us, uh, we're talking about what, what are the keys to magnetically attract your dream client? And he said, you have to know who you are and then you have to recognize what you're afraid to say is what your client needs to hear. Uh, and then you have to have the bravery to stand up and speak. That's, and I think that's great advice. That, that, that's awesome. So, so now let, let's talk about this title. Cause I get, I'm curious. I want to know how you came up with, I, I think it's the greatest thing, right? <laughs> this, this, this title is, I'm always trying to come up with titles as Tate will tell you, this yeah. is excellent. I mean, so you're the author of this bestseller, the power to speak naked. So how did you come up with the title first off? Well, it, it's funny because the, as I said, the book actually, um, was the book was written before I even had the title in place. And uh, the book came about because my agent said, if you want bigger stages, Tyler, you need to have a book. And so I was like, all right, fine. I'll, I'll write a book. And then I didn't want to write a book. And she's, and then we figured out I could just speak the book, but I was coming up to a deadline with my publisher. A publisher was like, listen, we need to have the cover art. If we're going to have the cover art, we need to have a title and no title, no cover art, no cover art, no book. We And you've got until tomorrow to get it to me. So I, I got my team together. We had a brainstorming session. We love to yes and things. You know, it's a thing. Again, I grew up in theater, so I was doing theater sports. You always yes and. And so we do this exercise where we, you know, no idea is a bad idea. Uh, there are some ideas that are better than others, but no idea is a bad idea. And each person then has to glob onto that little bit of, uh, uh, of what was that kernel of, of good, you know, what was the nugget in there and then expand on it. And so we're doing this brainstorming session. And I said, you know, the book's about advice. So what's some of the advice that you've gotten around public speaking and people, so, you know, do this and drink some water and, you know, visualize and all the stuff. And one of my teammates uh, said to me, well, you know, if you're trying to overcome the fear of public speaking, you picture your audience naked. And I broke the rule. I didn't. Yes. And I instantly went, no, that is not that is the worst advice ever. It's I don't know where it came from, but it is an absolute wasted exercise. It's disrespectful to your audience. Your audience is, is a golden treasure. You need to, to value your audience as though they're sacred and, and to, to try to gain comfort out of somebody else's discomfort. It's almost masochistic. Like you do not do that. That is, it's is wrong. It's so, so wrong. I would rather give somebody the power to speak naked than to try to picture them naked. And as soon as I said it, everybody went, Oh, that's a, that's a title right there. And, and then the more we unpacked it, the more we explored it, the more it continued to resonate with me because on its surface, I literally would love to give somebody so much confidence in their messaging that they could go out on stage in the emperor's new clothes, deliver their greatest address ever. And nobody would even know because they were so captivated by their words that they that what they were wearing was completely irrelevant. So on its surface, I legitimately would love to give people the power to speak naked. And in fact, I have done it once for charity and was happy to do it. And if anybody needs to raise money, know that Tyler will come and do the power to speak naked 
in his birthday suit. Be forewarned, it's not as glamorous as it sounds. <laughs> but I'm willing to do it for charity. Only for charity. I will do it for charity. But, you know, <laughs> the next level to that is to be that captivating that you that you can give a naked presentation. You don't need a PowerPoint. You don't need audio visual. You don't need props. You don't need AV, laser lights, all the rest of the gimmicky stuff. Can it enhance your message if used correctly? Absolutely. Do you need it? Not even a little bit. And so to give people the power to give just a naked presentation themselves, their audience, and a communicated idea that makes an audience move and resonates with them. That's what I want to do. And then on the sub level, it's what we talked about. That, that fear of, of exposing yourself and letting people in and see the raw naked truth. If you can conquer that and, and reveal yourself to the world in your full glory, that's when you have power. That's when you can really step into yourself. That's when your message has resonance because nothing can assault you at that point when you own it when you own everything 100 this is who i am come see me then nobody can attack you because you, you you're addressing your faults and you're claiming your strengths and you're working on them together at the same time and that's when you have true power so the power to speak naked the more we thought about it the more it resonated with me and i wanted to have that fun little tongue-in-cheek jab at you know picture your audience naked no you get out be brave you be naked first your audience will follow Hmm. So, so the people they'll take away the, these techniques, or is it like a mindset process that's going to embolden them? What, what are they specifically going to take away? So, the book is broken into ten chapters, and each one kind of addresses another area. A lot of what people do, and most of the reason why people are afraid of public speaking, is because of their own internal dialogue mm -hmm. telling them that they can't. And so, we spend a lot of time. Uh, reprogramming that that hey the audience is on your side you are the expert or you wouldn't have been asked to speak and then showing them how to properly prepare because that's where the majority of people who've had a bad experience public speaking have usually prepared incorrectly most of what they've done is tried to memorize word for word for word this wrote script speech and if you've got like 45 minutes of dialogue i was a professional actor for 30 years and in the, the largest role that I've ever had, I don't think I spoke for 45 minutes. Like to actually learn 45 minutes of dialogue is massive. And most people who are trying to do this have been told that they're giving a presentation two weeks from now. No, I like if I'm rehearsing an entire play, I, I'm rehearsing for months. Like I'm, I'm producing a musical right now and I have a very small role in it. And we're... <laughs> I, we, our rehearsal started in January and we don't mount the show until the end of April. So like, no, the, these people gi are giving themselves unrealistic expectations. You want to talk about going to the moon. I'd rather try to get to the moon than try to memorize 45 minutes worth of dialogue in two weeks. <laughs> that to, the moon is easier. So, I agree. <laughs> so, so many, I, a lot of what we do in the book is show people how to correctly prepare. S stop trying to memorize a script. It'll never do you any good know the destination you're trying to take your audience on learn the waypoints the the bullet points that you need to do, take them to on that journey and understand that it can be flexible learn how to analyze your audience learn how to center yourself so a lot of what we do is deal with uh, uh mental preparation uh pre-talk routine getting yourself into uh, a place of comfort so that you, it's, it becomes automatic that you can just stand up. If you need to deliver, like you and I are right now, right? This, we, this is not rehearsed. I don't know what you're going to ask. So let's go at it, Eric. And, and I am so confident in what I do and how long I've been doing it and what I do know versus what I don't know that we can have this dialogue and we could continue this on for probably another day or two if needed because I know where I'm at. And that's, that's what they pull out of the book to find that confidence within themselves to be able to communicate effectively and win over their audience. That's great. I, I think that sounds like that's a book everybody needs because at some point, you know, you, everybody's a public speaker at some point. Yes. Mm -hmm. you, you're speaking to somebody, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're speaking to somebody, it's your employees could be a client. So these principles apply. 
Yeah. Clients, prospects, and employees. You are always, always, always public speaking and your messaging and how you communicate that is, is critical. And, and yeah, public speaking is that number one leadership soft skill that really separates the wheat and the chaff. You know, the people who are really, really good, effective leaders are the ones who have mastered this skill set. Yeah, totally agree. Now, and you've been, you've been on over 300 podcasts. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, I'm just curious, like, is there that one question or, or maybe two that you never get asked by other podcasters that you wish people would ask you? Yes. So it's funny because the one question it, it gets asked every once in a while. And I, I've liked, you know, the interesting wording of it, you know, what do you want your legacy to be or how would you like to be remembered? But the question that, and I, I, I love answering that one and it's not asked often, but the one that nobody ever asks is why did I dedicate my book to my daughter? Hmm. And that's the one that is probably the most important to me. Like it, it, hmm. It's, it's, you know, the, the book dedication really speaks to why I do what I do. And, you know, it, in the book, uh, I written to my daughter, may you always have the courage to speak up for what you believe in and the confidence that your voice will be heard. And it's important to me that everybody have that. That if it's something that you really, truly believe in, that you know in your core to be true that you have the confidence to stand in your power and say, Hey, this is how I feel. This is what I think. This is, this is what I believe and know that there is somebody out there who not only needs to hear that message, but will receive it and receive it gladly. And I think the the more people can understand that that is an actual fact, like that's not even just a wishful hope for me. That is a fact. There is somebody out there who feels the way that you do. The leader is the one who says it first. And mm. I want my daughter to be a leader. So it ties back to the question that I do get asked. You know, what do you want your legacy to be or how do you want to be remembered? I remember one, the the best wording of that version of the question that I ever got was a hundred years from now, somebody's doing a book report on you. What mm. do you want them to read in your, in your biography? And I went and, you know, how do you want to be remembered essentially? And I, I, without a blink, I want to be remembered as Mackenzie Foley's father, the mm-hmm. father of Mackenzie Foley, who went on to do and insert what it is. Cause I have no idea. My daughter's only seven years old. I don't know what she's going to do with her life, but I know she is destined for greatness. And it is my job to steward her along the way. She is my legacy. She is how I will be remembered. I don't want to be remembered for the things that I did. I want to be remembered for the things that my daughter did. And that I prepared her on her journey to do those things. And so that's why the book is dedicated. And it's always it's funny. Nobody has ever asked me ever, why did you dedicate the book to your daughter? And that it's the question that I wish more people would answer because it speaks a lot to who I am. Hmm. Wow. Oh, that That's powerful. And someone that has two young kids, that I, I resonate with that. Because definitely you think about the, the, the little ones and you know you want to take your life experiences and share it with them so a lot of times even with me right I'm, I'm saying certain things about overcoming procrastination but i may be i'm really talking to two little people right <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know yeah and, and sometimes i'll talk to them and they've overheard me on a podcast or they've overheard me talking to a client and so this it, it resonates so no i i totally get it and, and i'm glad you got to talk about that on the 30 minute hour podcast you've been on well, I, I appreciate others, you got to talk about that on the 30 minute hour yeah no and and the, there you go eric you get to be the first for me and that's saying something because as you pointed out i'm actually up to over 350 podcasts in the last wow. 18 months so uh, i've been on a lot and i appreciate that you were my first to get to answer that question that nobody has asked me. wow yeah, that is that is fantastic i, I feel honored all right, now that's good stuff. So, so we're we're at the um, the final portion of this show. It's called "Write This Down," and this is where we each go around and give at least one takeaway from today's episode that we want people to write down so they can level up. So, Tyler, we'll start with you as the guest of the honor. 
what do the people need to write down? The thing you're afraid to say is what your ideal audience needs to hear. Find the courage to say it. You'll find your leadership. Mm. Mm. The thing you need to say is what your audience needs to hear. No, that, that's awesome. Thank you. That's a profound point. Okay, Ted. How do I follow Tyler? How do I follow Tyler? With style and grace, Ted. Man, I'm telling you. So, so, so one thing that I always say is uh, when it comes to speaking, public speaking, whatever, is speak intelligently about what you know and what you don't know really try to stay away from. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty simple. So as you start talking about when you're doing public speaking, all that, I mean, it's up to you. You decide where you're going to you're going to take folks. Right. So you take them down a road that, you know, <laughs> you know, the direction. Yep. Don't try to go someplace that you really don't know. Right. So I say speak intelligently about what you do know, and what you don't know. Try your best to stay away from. Them. Now, if they ask you a question or something, then they can take you someplace else. But for the most part, if you can control it. Oh, yeah. Never say you're a Sherpa if you've never been to the summit. Mm. Wow. Right. Yeah, there. you can write that down, too. There you go. There you go. Look, okay, go throw another one in there. There you go. Man, no, no, Ted, I think that's a great point. That, that's a great point. And, and so, so for me, um, like, like I just, in my speaking career, if I think of like a, an engagement or presentations that didn't go well, it was because I was trying to be impressive. Mm. I was trying to impress the audience and this and that. And I just learned a long time ago from a couple of mentors, this idea that you can really never be nervous if your heart is on service. Mm. And Write that down. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can never be nervous if your heart is on service. And when you really think about it from the standpoint of, I really want to help the audience with this message. I have something, a life experience, and I really want to get this message across to them. I don't think you're really going to be as nervous because you're trying to help. Think about it. The last time you tried to go help somebody, were you nervous? No. But when the focus is all on yourself and style points and all that, that's when you you're likely to bomb. So, so that that that's my takeaway. And really think about how you can help your audience with your message and your story. You have your story for a reason. You know one. You know one other thing I think is work on getting a voice like Eric because you can just <laughs> say some stuff. You know, I just don't know what I'm about to say. <laughs> right. but it's gonna be. <laughs> Bear with me. And you'd be like, man, that was great. Like, you know, it's got the whole voice thing down. So if you can get that, that voice part down, that helps a lot, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, powerful, I mean, I, powerful voice, a good resonance, you know, yeah, always, you. always helps. I uh, took a because, again, right, I'm Canadian and I'm about to say the most Canadian thing ever. I took a puck to the throat as a goaltender and uh, I lost my voice for oh, which wow. as a public speaker was like terrifying but as it started to heal i i couldn't speak for about a week and as it started mm. to heal i had this really deep raspy voice like this for like the longest while and so all of my podcasts came across really um really slow because i had to take my air in but there was very uh there was a wise tone about it and then as i started to get back into my speaking voice i was like oh i miss wise tyler that was a good voice <laughs> wise <Man>. tyler <laughs> A puck to the throat, man. Gee, yeah. it hurts. I'm I mean, sure. It, I'll, I'll, and when we're off, when we're offline, I'll send you guys the pictures of the bruise. It was massive. It was like this. <laughs> oh man! Look, look, Eric. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> a bruised up throat. <laughs> Boy, that that puck to the throat doesn't sound like something man. you want to experience anytime soon. No, I do not recommend it to the average Joe. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> well, well, Tyler, we, we definitely want to thank you for everything you shared. How can the people connect with you? Well, the first thing they can do is probably check the show notes. And uh, if they're if they're there, they're already on your platform, Eric. And so my 
a humble request before anybody starts looking for how to connect with me, they've already connected with you and Ted. And if they're getting value out of the 30 minute hour, I would really strongly encourage them to take a moment right now and just hit pause on this. If it's a recording or if, as it's live, you know, put the little five star thing and click that fifth no, star. And then in the comments, they're not this, just there for decoration. They're there for your use. So leave a comment and let Eric know what it is about this show that resonates with you. Why do you keep coming back here? What is the content that you're consuming? What is, what's your favorite takeaway from any one of the shows? What was your favorite takeaway from this show? Be specific with your comment and that's going to help all of us. It's going to help you because then Eric and Ted will know what is resonating with you and they can try to find more guests that can bring that kind of messaging to you. It's going to help them because now they know what you want to listen to. And if they're helping you, that's going to help grow the show. If they're helping grow the show, that's going to help me because more eyeballs are going to be on this episode because when it gets released, I'm going to be at the top of the list and then more people will be there. So it'll help everybody. If you can just leave a little five-star review and write the comment let us know what it is that you're enjoying about the show. If you're willing to do that, then in the show notes, you'll find my information, or you can just go to SeanTylerFoley.com. Sean is spelled the proper Irish way, S-E-A-N-T-Y-L-E-R-F-O-L-E-Y.com. Uh, make sure to, to go there. And as a thank you to me, if you're willing to leave a five-star review for these guys and, and let them know in the comments what about the show is resonating with you, then it would be my honor to give you a free PDF download of the book, The Power to Speak Naked. So you don't have to spend the $17.95 in bookstores. You can just get the PDF download for free. I'll also give you access to my Drop the Mic Trainer series, which is seven five-minute videos. So you can digest it over a week. If you give yourself five minutes while you're drinking your coffee in the morning, You'll be able to take in these videos. They'll give you actionable steps to make you a more confident public speaker. And it gives you access to my private Facebook group, Endless Stages, where I go live every Tuesday at noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, and do a live training for 20 minutes on whatever happens to be the hot topic in the group that week. So if you're struggling with something, you comment in the group. I take a note of that, and then I will come and train on that. And you can come on live. We can do a hot seat, or we can make it however you need it to be. But I do that every Tuesday at noon Pacific, three Eastern. All of those things are my gifts to your audience, provided that they give you a five-star review. No five-star review, no gifts for you. No gifts for you. That's right. I like that. That's a ring to it. No five-star review, no gifts for you. No gifts for you. I appreciate that. No, thank you. Thank you. That's much appreciated. Oh, absolutely, Eric. And thank you for the opportunity to come on and, and have such a wonderful conversation with you guys and for finally having somebody ask me about the dedication. So That's it's it. only taken 350 podcasts. To get there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now this has been an amazing episode and don't forget to share the show. Share the show. Share right. the show. Don't, don't keep this episode to yourself. Let's put it out there. Uh, everybody needs the power to speak naked. <laughs> I mean, that could be a total game changer. Make sure you get the book and watch this episode. And don't forget, you can listen to this episode as well on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or any of those places. And I am happy to report we've just surpassed 700,000 total downloads. Would you look at there? Wow. Absolutely. We want to thank you for listening and the, the listening and sharing that you've done. But let's keep doing it. Uh, thank you. This has been another great episode. And until next time. Have a great one.